What would we do now? Again, this is the start of the analysis, but as a start, he should uh, take vitamins, specifically probably folic acid. He should probably limit his exposure to bright light, wear sunglasses, and it may affect the way he, he uh, metabolizes drugs. I don't want to minimize this. I want to say two things. First of all, we sequence somebody uh, 80 years old who has lived a relatively healthy life, so we shouldn't expect that they're going to die at 24. Uh, so I don't want to minimize it. But there, I do want to say this is just the start uh, of the analysis. And it will really take the combination of Jim, Jim's medical records, his bone density, his tennis prowess, and all the information about Jim, and his sequence. And it will take that being done over and over again so we can create references. So when each of us, 10 years from now, goes in, has their genome sequence, we can tell you specifically which drugs to take, what lifestyle changes to make. And of course, you all read ahead, it was clear from his DNA that he was going to win the Nobel Prize in 1962. <laughs> I'm going to do this quickly. Where have we come from? Well, first of all, I felt pretty good that the guy that gave us the basics of heredity would know the basis of, of his personal genome. We did our first sequencing in 2005, and we can sequence bacteria, and now we can sequence for less than a million an individual human. Now that's where we've been, where are we going? I truly believe Jim is the first of us. Because he was sequenced in the miniature, every single time scientists double the density or have the density on one of these trips, you get four times the output. Just like every two years, you have to buy a new computer that's twice as powerful. Every few years, this technology is destined, just absolutely destined, to become more powerful. We've shown that we can sequence individuals. And I think what's really important, as Amy pointed out, Jim is making his genome available to everybody on the web so there can be further study and really make a statement that you don't have to be afraid of your genome. I believe personal genomes will have a profound effect. If you think about Jim's list of 23 genes that have specific mutations that tell him uh, where he may be affected, and you think about somebody five years from now, uh, before they have a child, looking at the list from their prospective uh, partner and seeing which genes overlap. Right now, if you're an Ashkenazi Jew, you check for Tay-Sachs in both couples. In the future, you'll check both genomes and, and you'll mitigate your risk or watch uh, as uh, you have that baby. I am convinced the genomes will not only be $10,000, but they'll be $1,000. And I have to tell you, Noah is fine. Thank you. Uh, so I, I've got a sense of urgency. I think we have goals which can be reached. I think it will uh, excite the uh, Congress to think that we're actually going to try and improve the world. And uh, last but not least, it will start a process which people in other parts of the world might think the United States is well run. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim Watson. I have one last very pleasurable duty, which is in accordance with the ethical establishment of the data flow uh, model we've established for this project. Data have gone from Dr. Watson's circulating blood cells to 454 in Connecticut, where the sequences were generated, here to Baylor, where David Wheeler and his group have uh, done the analysis and compiled the uh, submittable data on this equivalent of a DVD. It's too much data. It's on a hard drive. <laughs> So I'm passing it back to Jonathan Rothberg at 454 Life Sciences so he can pass it on to Dr. Jim Watson, the first oh. personal genome. And 
With that, I close the proceedings. Thank you all for coming.